Hello and welcome back to the Ashlands. Today we'll be doing a deep dive into Valheim's seventh boss, Fodder. I doubt I'm pronouncing that right, but I'm sure I've got the facts right. To summon him, you'll need to place three bells on their respective stands, and each bell is made from three bell fragments, which can be found in the charred fortresses scattered across the Ashlands. So now that you've summoned him in, the skeletal dragon has 25,000 base health, making it the tankiest beast yet by far. Something important to note here is that this health value is if you're fighting him solo. Like every other creature in Valheim, each additional player linearly adds 30% to the health pool. In this case, each additional player adds 7500 health or the health of Lord Rito. This brings his health up to 32,500 for two players, 40k for three, and 47.5 thousand for a party of four. This boss is immune to both fire and spirit, being resistant to pierce, and like all other bosses, he can't be staggered. These stats are great and all, but the most important aspect of this boss is how great the music is and how much you need to turn it on. Before we get into his 12 attacks, I want to note that in a very similar manner to health, attack damage is also scaled linearly by 8% per additional player. But with that out of the way, his first attack is a bite, which deals 210 pierce in a very similar manner to the locks. And the next two attacks are similar to motor's left and right claw swipes, with both of these new attacks dealing 200 pierce. His final melee attack is a scaled up Valkyrie spin, which deals 140 pierce in a huge area. All three of these attacks can be blocked with the new shields, however, it is important to note that the boss cannot be staggered from parrying. The first ranged attack is similar to Yaglet's Meteor. This attack will loosely target the player with 10 meteors, each dealing 40 blunt and 120 fire on impact. They also leave a small AoE which deals 80 fire and 80 spirit. His first health dependent attack is a wall of fire. This will become active once the boss has reached 90% health, and will summon an AoE in a circle around the player, which deals 80 fire and 80 spirit damage. This particular attack can be jumped over with a high enough jump skill, but it can be difficult at times. Next up is the Flea Breath attack stolen directly from Motor. This attack becomes available after the boss reaches 85% health, and it deals 60 fire and 60 spirit, while also leaving an AoE which does an additional 60 fire damage. His next attack is the Roar, which doesn't deal any damage directly, but will summon in 8 enemies. These 8 enemies can either be lower health versions of charred warriors, or lower health versions of charred marksmen. Additionally, this attack can only become available after the boss has reached 55% health. His most devastating attack is called Fissure. This one shreds both armor and buildings like you wouldn't believe, and it follows the player. This attack also becomes available once the boss is down to 55% health. It deals 120 fire and 80 spirit damage. The good news is, this attack can be dodged rather consistently by continuing to run, but can be extremely punishing if you're too slow and run out of stamina. This one can also be uniquely helpful, since it kills spawns and thus can be used to clean up the arena after a roar. As such, when this attack gets activated, start running towards every chard you see, and they'll be gone in a few seconds. The next attack is an intense version of the roar, which is activated when the boss is below 35% health. This version is the exact same as the normal one, with the only difference being that the enemies are spawned 42% faster. Similarly, the next attack is an intense version of the fissure attack, which is also activated when the boss reaches 35% health. This version deals the same damage per hit as the normal one, but it attacks 33% faster, and thus you will likely take about one third more damage. Finally, the last attack is an intense version of the meteor attack, which is activated when the boss is below 25% health. This version is also the exact same as the normal one, with the only difference being that the 10 meteors spawn 28% faster. So now that we've gone over the exhausting stats of this creature, what's the best way to make another fatherless household? At this point in the game, you generally have three main options, the tank, archer, and mage classes. If you are legitimately fighting this boss, I generally find the tank option to be the best for solo players. However, you can certainly beat this boss as any of the three. So let's go ahead and talk about the armor options for the tank. Raw numbers would suggest that you should be in Fenris. However, this is a dumbass idea as you should be drowning in fire resist wine due to all the flame attacks. Additionally, due to all the pierce damage, your best option at close range is actually heavy armor with a root harness, since the fire resist wine overrides the fire weakness of the chest plate. But let's go ahead and throw another asterisk on this because if you pop bone mass, the root harness also loses its advantage and you're back to wanting heavy armor. In conclusion, you have two main options for armor. 
heavy with bone mass and fire resist wine, or root chest plate with fire resist wine when your bone mass is on cooldown. Getting into weapons, your highest damage option is the Thundering Berserker Axes, with Nidhogg the Thundering and the Stormstar being tied for your highest one-handed damage options. Though something interesting I found during testing is that the boss can still be frozen by the primal weapons, and as such, your best melee option by far is the primal berserker axes. Given the fissure attack that comes off so often in this fight, you won't be able to stay in one place and just wail on the enemy the whole time, and when you're away from the boss you should probably still have a ranged weapon on you. When it comes to which one to pick, I'll discuss that in a second. This leads us nicely onto the Archer class. There is a lot of overlap here with the tank class as a dedicated Archer should still have a melee weapon as a backup and can still wear the heavy armor set. However, a dedicated Archer has a few more armor options. A full Ask set will greatly limit your armor, especially when you don't have bone mass up, but it will give you some extra pierce damage and stamina. Unfortunately, this extra pierce damage won't go a long way since this boss is inconveniently resistant to pierce. The other options, of course, would be to gain a bit of extra mobility by swapping out the pants and or chest plate on a tank set for their ask alternatives. When it comes to bows, your highest damage option by far is the Stormfang due to the chance to proc lightning effect. This number should actually be even higher due to the fact that I've seen the lightning effect chain between multiple parts of the boss, thus dealing significantly higher damage. This would be the bow that I generally recommend, however if you're playing a more supportive role, the Root Fang can also be viable due to the chance of freezing the enemy. When it comes to arrows, Frost and Poison end up dealing the same amount of damage, however, I'll still probably use the Frost due to that sweet 0.1 seconds of Frost effect. Crossbows are a similar deal to bows, however, due to the lack of elemental bolts and the slower fire rate, I'd highly recommend sticking with the bows. Getting into the mage option, you really only have one main armor set, the full Embla set, which gives you plus 130% magic regen. You do, of course, have the option to do a hybrid build with some heavy or root armor, but you end up sacrificing so much magic regen that I typically advise against it. With this class, your first line of defense is distance, followed by your magic hamster ball. This ball seems to break quite quickly during this fight, so you'll find yourself recasting it a lot. From what I've found, the Staff of the Wild and the Dead Razor are both relatively useless as their summons die extremely quickly to all the AoE attacks, and similarly, the Staff of Embers doesn't do a whole lot considering the boss is immune to fire. That fire immunity also severely limits the damage potential of the Fracturing Staff. Thus, your best directly offensive magic options are the Dunder and Frost Staffs. Now with the last staff, we start to get into our exploits. The Trolls, summoned by the Troll Staff, don't seem to be targeted by this boss. This means that if you summon a couple trolls and run for the hills, you can sit back and watch his health whittle away. Of course, you could also speed this up by shooting him with ranged weapons instead of just crouching behind a wall, but then you're going to aggro him and he might try to come kill you. The next couple of things aren't necessarily exploits, but ways to possibly make the boss easier. Shield generators can tank about two barrages of meteors each, so having a bunch of them circled around the boss can help you avoid that particular attack. The other thing is that you can set up a bunch of ballistas to shoot this boss for you. However, since you can't use his trophy on them, they are just as liable to shoot you, and also, given his pierce resistance, you'll need about 20 to 30 of them to actually kill him. This fight currently yields one trophy and five fodder relics. These relics are not currently used for anything, but will certainly become essential for starting off in the deep north. After mounting this trophy on the spawn altar, you'll gain access to a new Forsaken power, which increases your carry weight by 300 and speed by 10%. And with all that, we've covered every aspect of the new Ashlands boss. If you found this video helpful, it would be greatly appreciated if you could hit the like and subscribe buttons, as it will help others to find this video. Also, be sure to leave a comment down below with any strategies you found to make this fight even easier. Happy gaming, and don't become cannon fodder.